Hello, my name is Rafael Vidal, and for my in-service for pediatrics, I'll be covering hypertensive crisis in pediatrics. And so with that, I'll start going into the learning objectives. So the learning objectives for this presentation are to explain the epidemiology and pathophysiology of hypertensive crisis in pediatrics, summarizing current treatment options of hypertensive crisis, and evaluating clinical literature involved in treatment. So hypertensive crisis, it's known as a severe blood pressure elevation, and it's usually divided into two categories, emergency or urgency. Emergency is a severely elevated blood pressure where there's evidence of target organ injury, usually seen in the central nervous system, the kidneys, or the cardiovascular system. Some examples of these can manifest as encephalopathy or seizures. And urgency is also severely elevated blood pressure, but there's no evidence of secondary organ damage. But if it's not treated, then it can still cause damage in the future. Hypertensive crisis isn't usually a condition that we see in pediatric patients, but it does have the potential to be life-threatening. According to the AAP 2017 Hypertension Guidelines, the following constitute immediate urgent care. So if they have a blood pressure reading that's at stage 2 with symptoms, or if there's a blood pressure greater than 30 milligrams of mercury above the 95th percentile, or greater than 180 over 120 if they're adolescent. So stage 1 hypertension in children is usually when the systolic or the diastolic is within the range of the 95th percentile to the 99th percentile plus 5 millimeters of mercury. Stage 2 is greater than 99th percentile plus 5, milligrams, 5 millimeters of mercury. And some sources mention that there's no specific cutoff that indicates when hypertensive crisis occurs. But many providers seem to use the stage 2 hypertension as the reference point. And the reason that there isn't a cutoff is due to the variability of normal blood pressure in children due to their age, their sex, and their height. So for the epidemiology, the prevalence of hypertension in children is low. So based on the guidelines, we saw that it was about 3.5% in children and adolescents. And we also see the same range in prehypertension. So that's about 2.2 to 3.5% in prehypertension. And data shows that high elevations of high blood pressure in children also correlate with high blood pressure elevations in adults. And they can also have greater onsets of hypertension in adulthood. Moving on to pathophysiology and etiology. So primary hypertension can be evaluated in children and adolescents. That's based on a high blood pressure and that's usually also associated with being overweight, but you can consider other things such as substance abuse. Secondary hypertension is usually seen in younger children, such as newborn infants, and that's usually as a result of renal artery thrombosis or stenosis. can also be from congenital renal malformation or coarctation of the aorta. And some older children may also have acute or chronic renal parenchymal disease. An elevated blood pressure also shows a correlation with early development of cardiovascular changes. Acute phases of hypertensive crisis can be attributed to increased levels of vasoconstrictors in the body, such as norepinephrine or angiotensin II. And if there's any arteriolar fibrinoid necrosis, there can be endothelial damage that can result in an organ ischemia, and that's further going to trigger the release of vasoactive substances that cause vasoconstriction. So for presentation, patients can come in and be asymptomatic and not show any signs that they're having hypertensive crisis, but they can also have more broad symptoms. Different age groups don't usually have specific clinical presentations, but it's important to rule out crisis if the patients are presenting with symptoms such as headache, nausea, vomiting, or altered mental status. And organ dysfunction usually includes hypertensive encephalopathy, acute left ventricular failure, and acute myocardial ischemia. You can also see elevated liver, uh, liver function tests and other uh, lab abnormalities. When you're evaluating a patient that might have hypertensive crisis, it's important to gain a detailed physical exam. So you want to make sure that you get the height, the weight, the forelimb, blood pressures, and a fundoscopic exam. 
For laboratory tests, you want to get a metabolic panel, a complete blood count, and a urinalysis. And you also need to evaluate kidney function. A chest radiograph or electrocardiogram may also be considered if the patient is having chest pain or tachypnea, and that's to assess for any congestive heart failure or myocardial hypertrophy. A CT scan of the brain can also show us and give us more information on neurological symptoms that the patient may be having or if they're having abnormal neurological findings. And of course, it's important to find identification of secondary causes. So you can also warrant for more additional lab testing if there's other suspected conditions in the patient, such as lupus, hyperthyroidism, or any structural abnormalities. So for treatment, the main goal is treatment and prevention of life-threatening complications of hypertension-induced organ dysfunction. And we also want a gradual blood pressure reduction in a controlled manner. The rate at which the blood pressure will be lowered depends on the presentation and if it's emergency or urgency. Usually the blood pressure goal is below the 95th percentile unless there are also concurrent conditions in the patient, in which case the blood pressure should be lowered to below the 90th percentile. So for emergency, we're going to treat with IV hypertensives that can produce a controlled reduction in blood pressure and we're aiming to decrease the blood pressure by about 25% over the first eight hours. And we're going to normalize the blood pressure over the next uh, one or two days. Very important to not drop the blood pressure too much because that can prevent, in order to prevent hyperperfusion of vital organs. Um, and so IV drugs are used because it's easier to titrate and it's easier to control the rate of the blood pressure decrease. And then urgency is usually treated over a longer period of time with IV or PO drugs. The medication choice depends on the patient presentation. So like I mentioned before, usually you can give IV or oral depending on how they're presenting. And you also can give adequate fluid replacement if they're volume depleted. Some examples of preferred agents are esmolol, libetalol, hydralazine, and nicardipine. You can also see sodium nitroprusside if there's any pulmonary edema, or severe left ventricular dysfunction. Clonidine and ACE inhibitors have also been used, but they are a little bit more challenging uh, to use in this condition. So here's a little bit more about the treatment. So you can see the, ni the sodium nitroprusside, like I mentioned before. So the initial IV infusion is usually 0.3 to 0.5 micrograms per kg per minute, and you'll titrate that every five minutes to a usual dose of 4 micrograms per kg per minute to a max dose of 10 micrograms per kg per minute. So it's a direct arterial venous smooth muscle vasodilator, and it's usually very commonly used because it's easy to titrate for any blood pressure fluctuations. It also has a short half-life and a rapid onset, but you have to be careful because uh, renal or hepatic impairment can cause cyanide uh, metabolites to accumulate in the body. Hydralazine, you can see that the neonate uh, dosing is different from the pediatric dosing. And so hydralazine is an arterial vasodilator with a quick onset of action with a duration of action for about 4 to 12 hours. Um, and that can be challenging to titrate because it's usually in a bolus form. But you can also use this medication as intramuscular. Esmolol it has a rapid onset. It's uh, ultra short acting and it's a cardioselective beta-1 adrenergic blocking agent. Um, it does depend a little bit on renal and hepatic metabolism, but it's useful if you have congenital heart disease. And so you can see that there's a continuous IV infusion dose as well as an alternate dosing. Another example of a medication would be labetalol. So here you can see IV intermittent bolus dosing, and then you can see continuous IV infusion dosing. So labetalol, labetalol is an alpha and beta sympathetic blocker. It has a rapid onset, but it does have a long half-life. So that can make it a little bit more difficult to titrate. And it's usually contraindicated in patients who might present with asthma or lung diseases or any hyperkalemia or congestive heart failure. So the antihypertensive medication should be chosen based on the pathophysiological process that mediates the blood pressure elevation. So very important to know how your patient is pre presenting uh, to know which uh, antihypertensive we should use.
So here's some data based on literature evaluation they saw on the medication. So for hydralazine, in a study by Austere et al., they showed that in 110 hospitalized patients, systolic and diastolic medium reduction of blood pressure was 8.5 and 11.5%. And we also saw lower adverse effects. In Flynn et al., they evaluated the first 141 doses of hydralazine in children, and they saw that there was a 10 to 25% MAP reduction in about 47% of patients. So with both study, with both studies concluded was that hydralazine was very effective, but it had the potential to be um, to excessively drop the blood pressure. Um, and that was defined as about more than a 25% reduction in MAP. For labetalol, uh, Thomas, Thomas et al. saw that it was also an effective blood pressure medication. It did well on reducing blood pressure, but there was a risk for hypertension, hypotension in infants and young children uh, who were having the hypertensive crisis and if they had ischemic or, trauma, or traumatic brain injury. For nicardipine, there are multiple reports that demonstrated its effectiveness in blood pressure reduction, and it also showed that there was low adverse effects in multiple age groups. But the only side effect that they saw was that it could cause thrombophlebitis. For esmolol, it was also found to be safe and effective in children, especially postoperatively if they were having any cardiac surgery. So in Nicholson and all, uh, they saw that it was a safe and effective at, blo at blood pressure control and reduction at low, medium, and high doses after operation for a coarctation of the aorta. Uh, no dose response was shown in the study. So in conclusion, it's very important to evaluate the patient through physical exam and labs to determine if there are any underlying causes, and we want to mainly prevent any organ damage, and we want to reduce the blood pressure based on how the patient is presenting. And we need to choose an IV antihypertensive based on the patient's individual condition. So we can just go back and look into those studies and see um, how we can choose a certain medication for a certain patient. And here are my references. And with this, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And my email is Rafael C. Vidal at ttotc.edu if there are any questions. Thank you very much.